Keys, one of the last remaining hardwood hammocks in the Florida Keys due to Hurricane Irma. We sustained a lot of damage, but we have a nursery that was able to replace a lot of them as well. The city of Key West, when it loses a tree, we have a stipulation that, um, that if you choose to cut down the tree, how are you going to replace it? You know, everyone talks about a lot, and I know you've heard about the carbon footprint. Trees reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I mean, we did a research with FEMA after Hurricane Irma, and we're talking about hundreds of tons of carbon is diffused through this botanical garden every day, every day. I mean, 531 different species of native plants, well over 8,000 plants and all, that's a lot of carbon sucking down, right? The city of Key West is trying to do that as well, as well as to keep our picturesque island looking like an island and not like a met metropolis, right? We don't want to be a big city, we want to be the historic, the things that I fell in love with this island 26 years ago. Uh, the Tree Commission is run by Karen De Maria. She is the urban forestry manager and she is your first contact. Uh, within that, um, the, uh, the information and the process diffuses all the way down to Ed and I and the other uh, four members of the Tree Commission uh, to talk about issues that you bring up that you want to help with and the city's help with resolving. Uh, currently, we really process through about 60 um, cases a month, all right? Pretty much an all, all in all. I mean, I'm signing documents and of course, this is also you reaching out, working out with her because not everything has to go to permit. But if you're doing any major pruning on a tree and we're talking about three inches or bigger, you need a permit because we want you to do it right. We don't want, and I can't name any names, but last, last month we had a case where a neighbor came down and just butchered the neighbor's tree because it was hanging over the fence mm -hmm. and um, causes not only damage, I mean, tree abuse. That's what we cited them for, tree abuse. But listen, the neighbors were really pissed off about it too, right? So uh, we want to help everyone navigate that through the process, not only in your, within your yard, but next door neighbors. And the new case that we talked about too is trees on city property that impacts your property. Mm -hmm. Uh, Karen De Maria is awesome at all of it. She listens well and she'll tell you that, uh, tell you the, uh, the correct path and the methods, methodology of getting this is issue resolved, um, as well as, you know, she is an arborist, so she knows how to take care of a tree and she can walk you through that process too. So that, and this is what we learned from Hurricane Irma, we have an arborist, Kenny King, Golden Bough, has been working this garden as long as I have. He knows his trees, he knows his natives. You want somebody who knows the species and the environment on it and learn the word mitigation. Mitigation is taking care of it now so it will not be a problem later. And that's a key component too when you're looking at your yards and looking at your trees and your specimens that you're talking about because it doesn't necessarily mean cut down that beautiful old tree. Maybe it just needs to be shaped up a little better. That branch that's hanging out over it could be reduce back whatever the case, and that's what we at the City Key West Urban Forestry and the Tree Commission will do with you and work with you on it. If it gets to a case, as I pointed out, the neighbor cutting down a tree, it does come in front of us because we want to be a community of friends and family that we give a chance to actually mitigate between the two parties on the best way to resolve the issue. Uh, the last part of every tree commission is what we call administrative hearings. We're allowing the citizens of Key West to come to us before we get the lawyers involved. And what we do is we ask the public to, are you willing to step into administrative hearing? And if they say yes, then they prove their case. The city talks about the urban and the arborist. We have everyone's voices come in volunteer, and we come up with a, a reasonable uh, understanding and I think a reasonable um, what is the best word I can use um, at um, um, penalty if there is one? You know, whether it's going to be monetary, whether it's going to be timing, a lot of the cases uh, are one or the other or both. And when I say both, it may be in the case of the neighbor to neighbor. Um, they wanted an arborist to come out and take care of what was left that tree for three years. And as long as you agree on it and everyone is relatively happy after the incident, then it's a great way for us to say, okay, let's just happen, let's make it happen, and then let's just go forward. If someone chooses not to go that, then you're more than welcome to get your lawyers involved and get all that public stuff. 
uh, we try to mitigate everyone out of that process, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not, but I think our success rate has been pretty much 100% so far, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of, of my, uh, my fellow commissioners. They are all, um, most of them have been on there for a while. I'm relatively new compared as well as Ed to the others who've been on the commission before. Uh, why they chose me to be their chairman, the chairman is, uh, I guess, like I said, I'm honored, but I'm confused, but I'm gonna go with it. And I bring into that commission uh, the history of not only uh, my nonprofit history and my environmental um, uh, studies and conservation efforts, but you know, I've been with this organization for 25 years now. I know a thing or two about trees. Did anyone walk in today with a particular question about the Tree Commission permitting or Karen to Maria that I might be able to answer? So you mentioned this issue, uh, issue with the neighbor's trees and stuff. Um, you can call and still ask someone to come out and do an evaluation of a tree that's- You can call problem. Karen and she will come out and she will give you her opinion and what needs to be said and done. From there, she'll give you options on who you can call to come and actually do the work. Um, there is a permitting fee, and it's not that big, it's just administrative, you gotta pay Karen's salary. Ed and I are volunteers on the commission, just, on the commission, just like the other four. We give our time to help you, to help the city maintain its historical uh, look and the aesthetics that comes with mature trees that you want. And of course, one of my missions being conservationists and, na and native species uh, to eradicate those that are non-native or danger uh, to, uh, to, the, to the public and the city as well. Um, we look at that and everything, we get a report on every case on um, does it have a native status? Is it on the protected list? How imperiled is it? And when you talk about replacing a tree, these are all important things that you need to learn because you may be able to just replace a tree with the same size, but if you pick one of the other 10, it gives you two times the inches than you would just replacing what you have. What do I mean by that? That it is an imperiled threat, endangered or threatened species, it's more important than just the run of the mill, branchy pansy or whatever, right? We're gonna give you extra credit for that. So even when the big, big, big trees come down and we've had some 45, 48, 50 inches that, that had to come down, uh, there are ways to mitigate the replacement of them so you don't have to go all around the world looking for a tree that big. You can do three or four other ones that are just as beautiful, or will be, and uh, as of course we all know, once natives get established, they go, they go. I mean, we uh, planted a, uh, a um, stopper over in the, uh, the blue butterfly meadows. It was about this big, and within a year and a half, two years, it was already 10 feet tall, and now it's over 20 foot. So uh, once they get that tap root through that limestone, it goes, it grows. And then keep in mind too, I said it many times, aesthetic. They can be aesthetic, how? Because shape and look and shade is something we all appreciate, but just think about the birds and the pollinators and the butterflies and everything that native plants attracts. I did a presentation, which I'm gonna run through with you today, over at the uh, Wildlife Society of Big Pine, because not, this is something I learned, being stewards of the property and taking care of the plants. You know, the garden boasts 213 species of birds migrates through here. Our two butterfly gardens sustains the remaining 39 species of native butterflies of the Keys, which was 120 back in 2010. Where did they go? They're extinct. There's a species going extinct every day, over 200 species, it's still a fact. You can look it up. Over 200 species uh, of flora and fauna go extinct every day. Not monthly, not quarterly, not annually, every day. So we all should be doing our part to protect those. And my only soapbox speech I'll give today is that if mankind does not think we're in line with that extinction list, we better rethink that. Because if you can't take care of your environment, you certainly can't take care of yourself. All right? Not step off my box. <laughs> all right, I have a very short, uh, hopefully Ed is gonna help me do all of this stuff. Yeah. Do, do we have other questions related to the tree board? Not every tree requires a permit. Um, if you go to the city website, you can get a copy of almost everything that we have here. What trees require a permit, which trees do not require a permit. And uh, if you have a dead tree, that doesn't require a permit. 
Uh, there, but there's whole page, there's two pages of trees that you may have in your yard that do not require a, a removal permit. So uh, again, if you have questions, Karen will come out and take a look for you. Um, before any tree, uh, well, excuse me, a permit comes in for removal, um, it gets a, little, not a monthly agenda. That agenda is sent out all, to all the board members. We go out individually and look at those trees and make an evaluation. Is it, is it a proper removal? Is it not a removal? And uh, when we come back to the board meeting, uh, we discuss it. We listen to the property owner. We listen to an arborist. We listen to Karen. And then we discuss amongst ourselves, is that tree really need to come down or not? And um, there's a lot of um, things on Facebook that we approve everything. That's not true. We deny trees. If we think it's a healthy tree that's not in the danger to the property, um, we're not going to give you a permit to take it down. But with that said, there are a lot, we have a lot of large old trees in Key West. A lot of the mahogany trees, the large mahoganies are planted on uh, street side. First of all, that's the wrong tree for that site. It should have, they should have never been planted there, but the ladies back in the 30s, the garden club had a, you know, their heart was in the right place, but knowledge of what that tree was going to get it turned into, um, wrong place for that tree. Um, trees get, are like people. As we get old, we start falling apart. <laughs> Trees are the same way. They get uh, they get decay. They uh, here they're very very much. They sucking. get old. They get old. It's, it's and they start creaking like we do. But um, dry uh, drywood termites. What would termites? Termites on trees down here uh, for the large old trees um, are really devastating. Uh, the um, royal pontiana. They love royal pontianas. The big old ones. They get in there. Uh, my neighbor had a big one. Everybody was upset they took it down. When it hit the ground, the whole center was hollow with termites all the way up. Um, that tree was an accident waiting to happen. So we do, as a board, go look at the trees uh, that are put in for uh, removal and do uh, evaluate it. One of the things that um, happened in the state of Florida, uh, the state legislators, legislators so fit to take away our ability, our ability being Key West or any city, for home rule. Uh, we cannot um, overrule what the state says as far as tree removal. In other words, if, if you have a tree in your yard that you feel endangers your house, um, you don't need a permit, you can take it down. Now the state just changed that regulation last year Whereas you have to have a certified arborist come and um, advise you, is that tree truly a danger or not? Uh, but we still get involved with that. And the good tree trimmers in town come to Karen and say, hey, Karen, I got a, a customer that wants me to take this tree out. I'm just letting you know if you come take a look. And that sort of uh, plays both ways. It keeps the property owner out of trouble, keeps the tree trimmer out of trouble and it keeps uh, the city apprised of what's going on. And she can help make recommendations what to do to replace that tree. Mm -hmm. Did I hit the new law right? You did. Um, uh, what he, he put in there in between the lines a little bit is you just can't cut down the tree and said it's bad. We, you need to get somebody who will back that up and hopefully that's gonna be a certified arborist. Once it's said, and just like a dead tree, if it's proved to be a hazard and someone has documented that it is a hazard, uh, then you can remove that tree without the... Uh, the uh... And, and hazards include all sorts of things. It's hanging over your house, it's, it's against your house, it's destroying your foundation, the roots, uh, the, the roots are lifting up your house, uh, cracking the concrete. Um, and, and as we all know, there are a lot of big trees planted on these little lots, and our houses are squeezed together and those trees keep growing and what's going to give, your house is going to give. So there are valid reasons why big trees are permitted to be removed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you do your program. All right, thank and, you. And for sure, when we're all done today, if you have questions, 
uh, you can ask as a group or come up to us afterwards. And, and the question about the species that we want to add to the list, talk to us about that before you leave today and we'll make sure that gets back to the board. Yes, sir. Hey, question. If your insurance company comes out and says, we're not going to renew your policy because of these trees here that are overhanging your structures or whatever, is that a reason? That's why you go to Karen at the Urban Forestry and she will work with them and make sure it fits the criteria. Mm -hmm. That, that happens more th than often than not. The insurance company yes. comes down and looks at the trees. The utilities companies have been have been in trouble and fined before because they said one thing that necessarily wasn't in your best benefit. If, if you have a question, if you've not hired a tree company in the past and you want to know who reputable companies are, we, uh, we the board, uh, Karen, we can't tell you to use this guy, but we can tell you the best five in the city that, that have a very, very good reputation. Um, we, will, we will do that. We can't make one recommendation, but we'll give you a list of yeah, you know, we give guys. you a list. Now, if you're hanging around the botanical garden and see Golden Bough's tree truck, that might be a good recommendation, but I'm not going to say that. Let me bring the towel. Kenny King is awesome. He's, a, he's an old-time conk. I call him Daddy Grump. Uh, warning you about him, but he knows his stuff and he always goes for the benefit of this tree and the species and not just for the convenience of us, the public. Because as we all well know, human footprint is wide and long and most of that means decimation to just get rid of it all. All right, thank as you so a, much. As a consumer, be careful who you hire. Yes. Um, they should be a certified arborist and you can go to the ISA website and check. They should be in there and let's, uh, that means they follow the proper procedures for trimming and pruning and follow a code of ethics. The second thing is make sure they have insurance. And get, get proof of that insurance, especially if they're taking big limbs off your roof. Uh, you don't want them to drop a limb through your roof and, and then you turn around and the guy's gone. Uh, we, we get folks that come down the uh, keys from uh, other places in the state that aren't local, and um, some of those folks aren't as reputable as, as others. We have a lot of uh, don't folks be that, that don't. Yeah. yeah, don't be duped. Just because you want a chainsaw doesn't mean you're an arborist. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people with chainsaws that, that come out and do uh, horrendous damage to our trees. Be careful. Yeah. And I'd love for this group, this class here, to go out of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, presentation to say that I know that we have to be permitted to work on trees. You can't, you know, it's kind of like the IRS. You can't go in and say, I didn't know about that. Even, uh, yes, even uh, just one more step, even here at the garden, uh, we're part of, uh, what's that called? Uh, before we can move. We have a tree liaison committee. A tree liaison committee that goes back to Karen. Uh, to get permission before we can do major removal here. We, uh, we have that part of our lease. Uh, for who are the registered voters in Key West? If you voted yes, I love you that much. We love you. <laughs> if you voted no, stay after class. <laughs> yes, very much. Uh, in our lease, it is stipulated that we do not have to go up in front of the tree commission, especially now that Ed and I are on the tree commission, there's a conflict of interest. We have a tree liaison committee that consists of one tree commissioner, uh, one our arborist here at the botanical garden, and one citizen, three people. And what we do is we go quarterly and we go around and say, okay, we had problems with these trees. We want to remove these trees. We need these trees to be pruned. We want to replace trees. Because remember, a botanical garden is a collection of plants. It's just we're very unique in that we're native in our collection. And we let the tree commission know monthly, uh, quarterly, what is going on within our inventory, what had to be removed because it was dead, damages that came up with, or work that we wanted to have done down the road. In as much when we want to plant stuff in the garden, we report that as much because we are literally held at the same terms. If we remove a tree, what are we going to replace it with? No hole goes unfilled around here. Uh, for one, it's too hard to dig another hole. <laughs> we all know you don't dig a, hole, a plant to plant around here, you jackhammer it in. Uh, it's the same thing with us. So we have had a policy for the last, I guess, 11 years when we started our collection policy is that if we lose a tree or we have a reason to remove a tree is that we're gonna replace it with a native 
hopefully the same species, and the, the iconic idea that we had with our native nursery is to have a backup plant for every species we have in the garden. So if something happens, we got something there. And then when we got that far, we said, well, we need a backup to the backup, just in case. And then if we make five or 10 or 15 of them, we can sell them to you, because that's all right. Right? And uh, as we all well know, you want to know, know what a native tree looks like in your yard? Go take a walk. There's, uh, there's, there's 531 different species that you can, be, uh, that you can identify. And um, I can get in more than that in a second. First and foremost, I'm a 26 year resident. If I don't know you, it's my fault. I would love to get to know you. Um, I'm very fortunate to say and honored to say that I've been, um, I, um, uh, uh, I've been associated with actively uh, the Key West Botanical Garden for 25 of those 26 years. I started out as a volunteer that became a board member. In 2004, they hired me under a grant under the Department of Agriculture to do administrative work for 30 hours a week. And then within two years, they actually put me on payroll, as I fondly and teasingly say to Ed and everyone, I didn't climb the ladder, I climbed the tree. Because from there, I became the exec executive administrator, general manager, and I've been executive director now since 2013, uh, a position that I'm very privileged and honored to have, not only to represent this botanical garden and our board of directors, but to represent you, the community. I want to give you kudos for voting yes on this referendum because it shows as a community that we care about our environment, that we want to do something to conserve it, and that we want to protect this really, really rare and unique garden for the next 99 years, right? Um, right now, the, uh, the garden, when I started, the garden was only 7.8 acres. The key back in that day in the 96 and 7, it was brought to me in one of my latest, latest presentations when they used to come and visit when they were kids or their family, the parents brought the kids here that it was derelict. It was really at your own, enter at your own risk. In fact, I finally call those days the Indiana Jones days. Because you had to come in behind Bayshore Manor, park in the muddy parking lot, and hack your way over to Damien Pond. <laughs> there was one path that you literally had to hack it, so I think it Indiana Jones back in those days. Uh, uh, when I became a board member, there were four other board members, uh, five in all, that used to meet on our lawn chairs at the little muddy back entrance, which, on, which is our new big entrance now, and determine how we're going to save this botanical garden. Um, out of the 7.8 acres, uh, with a, uh, the help of a grant, which I'll get in more, we are currently at 15.2 acres, of which over 11 are accessible to the public. We still have those other four acres, this area back here, that we can do uh, about 20% build out on. In other words, infrastructure and so forth. So in Misha's perfect world, uh, we're going to have the orchid shed put in well, we used to have one years ago, I'll get into that in a second, uh, but also expand the nursery and put a new visitor center that's visible from US Highway 1. I think that's key and important because driving north or south, have anyone ever seen the little botanical garden sign? No, not unless you're stuck in traffic and then you're mad at the traffic, you're not paying attention to the street sign. I think it's key important to get our name out there. We're trying to do everything else that we can do it. Um, um, out of that, our nursery right now uh, it ha propagates about 196 native species out of our collection, uh, over 2,000 plants in all. But more importantly, uh, we have over 90 species that are on the state and federal th uh, endangered, threatened and endangered species list. What does that mean? One of the new plants that we just put into our nursery is part of our program. There's only three left in the wild. And we, we actually cage them, pro uh, protected them until we could get the seeds off of them. So uh, when they say imperiled, it means they're just about to fall off the ledge, right? So we're doing our part to preserve that, to protect that, and also me talking to you about it means educating you about it too, because native has a purpose. There's a reason why it's native, and they do have a, a, a aesthetic beauty as well. Uh, whether you want to go with your grasses understory, understory, midstory, or canopy, uh, all is involved in it. Uh, I wanted to break down. I'll probably break. Yeah, I can break this down a little more as we go forward. Uh, how many of you have heard me speak before? Very good. Okay, thank you so much. What I want to do is I'm going to go kind of fast so you can slow me down when you need to slow me down. This garden has a long history. 1914, the Sample family, which was a Rutgers family, owned the entire Stock Island. They needed it over to the city of Key West, uh, which was called Stock Island at the time because they couldn't pay their taxes. At that time, it was actually uh, designated as a recreational area. 
usually it's too fast for me. Now you're going to do too slow. There we go. What I want to point out is right here in 1936 was key. City of Key West was, was um, bankrupt. People were starving, couldn't work. There was no work to be had to it. Uh, part of the WPA, this 55-acre track, which became the uh, historic Key West Botanical Garden, uh, was actually uh, um, inspired by, created by the WPA, which was to put people back to work. Most importantly on it, when it was put in as part of the Emergency Federal Act, it was one of South Florida's biggest attractions. The whole idea was not only to put people back to work, but to get the people down here to come and see this botanical garden. It included a square area enclosed uh, by two foot high masonry walls. How many have been through the garden? You've seen the little rock walls? They didn't have the Topino family back there to haul everything away. You had to use it. So they created a rock wall that you used to go throughout the garden. Back in those days, it took five days to get throughout the entire 55 acres. It was a major event on it. But also it had um, an entrance expedition, um, exhibition off potting shed, greenhouses, uh, stone drainage channels, compost uh, pits, and grass-covered amphitheater. We tried to put one in back in 2005, but the city of Key West said there's no amphitheaters in Key West. Ta -da. <laughs> they already had another idea about it. 1945, uh, between 36 and 45, actually the big happen was to the end of the 30s and the 40s. The 55 acres got chopped down just like the rest of the keys for development. Uh, by 1945, the last piece of parcel, which we're sitting on now, was deeded over to the Navy. The law says you can take public land for military use during wartime. The Navy took it over, filled in the pond, put a hospital and barracks there, and uh, a mortuary, believe it or not. And they were all of that was to gear up for the Cuban crisis that they were planning on. The Navy needed that better firm hole and footprint within the Key West area for that reason. In 1936, the city commission finally designates 11, how much we start with? 55? 11 acres as a permanent, I love that word permanent, because it doesn't get too permanent later on, <laughs> uh, acres of wildlife and uh, nature sanctuary. The Key West Botanical Garden Society was created in 1988. God bless Miss Betty Davian, who's still with us. She's 101 years old, uh, still a mentor of mine, as well as one of our major contributors of this vision that she had back then. She had the knowledge, fortitude, and just the gumption uh, to pull in the Orchid Society, the Women's Club, the Garden Club, our, the, even the uh, um, Audubon used to meet all here at the garden at that time and realize that if we were going to protect what was left, which was 11 acres at that time, uh, we were to get a, um, uh, incorporated, get a 501c3, and get a lease with the city. Now, Ed will testify. For us to get our lease referendum actually approved to the city took us about a year and a half. And then uh, for me, when they changed the 35 year lease to 10 late years in, in 2016, is when I started on the city going, that's not right. That is just not right. Uh, which, uh, you know, made me afraid the city had another idea going on that they didn't want to give us an extension or a longer lease than that. Uh, but it took us all that time to do September to get the lease. Back in that day, it really took them all the way up to 1991. By then, the city finally recognized it, and the city gave management over of the remaining, remember that word down here, permanent? The remaining 7.8 acres of the garden. And uh, as I pointed out, I walked in here in 1996, fell in love with the visual beauty. I wanted to live on an island, and you knew you were on one. But it was pretty scary at that day. Uh, the big change happened in 2020. Uh, myself and my four board members took Betty's talking and took it a step further. We created a uh, master plan and a mission statement that set us apart from everywhere else, even in the keys on it. Uh, one of those was what we were planning to do with this garden in 20 years, and besides the amphitheater, pretty much everything has come true. Uh, but also, most importantly, uh, we switched from just being a botanical garden because, you know what, just like you, we weren't having any luck with the roses and the petunias and the tulips. They just don't do good down here. And as anyone around here knows, if there's dirt, dirt in someone's yard, it came from Home Depot. We don't have dirt. 
We have litter and then we had limestone. So we had to work with all of that. So we thought, well, you know, we're working with it already. Let's just make it that way that uh, we created our mission statement to focus on the native flora and fauna of the Keys, South Florida, Cuba, and the Caribbean. All right? So if you're looking at the map right here, you know, Texas is here and Florida is here, Cuba and the Caribbean. Anything that swirled in on the water or flew in from Island Island or that was already here, which is called Providence, we considered native. Now, certain trees were actually uh, grandfathered in back in the 30s when the garden started. They brought in over 30, uh, over 7,000 different tree specimens as far west as um, east as China. Uh, the only thing that was on it is they had to be tropical in nature. They weren't really particular or what else. There is a story in our, um, in our history that we have in our garden guide, and you can find it on the website, that one of the founding members back then that actually dug the first hole in the garden uh, she smuggled the seed of a, a China, of a China berry, I don't know what it's called, um, fragrant pink flowers. She smuggled it in her hat when she was traveling and she came and planted it in the garden. And back all the way up through the 60s, the tree was still here. Uh, but that's one of the things that we wanted to do is to focus on, let's see how it just jumps ahead of me. There we go. All right, bad machine, bad machine. Enough with that. TDC Grant put in our, our visitor center. The visitor center you see here wasn't here until 2002. We went to the TDC. Everyone knows who the TDC is. Tourist Development Council. For every one of your friends and family that comes in and stays in a hotel room, they pay 18 cents tax. A segment of that goes to the Tourist Development Council to reinvest in infrastructure. And that infrastructure is to the benefit of the tourists. Now, it benefits the uh, community as well because it's businesses that usually have to do that. So we were one of the first that went in. We needed uh, $200,000 to put in our business center. They freaked out because they had no nonprofit ever come and ask them for that in the past. But, you know, that was one of the three things myself and my four other board members came up with sitting in that old muddy trail back in 2000. Uh, one was, you know, Mama said you want people to come visit you, you fix up the front door. So that's why we put in the visitor center and the, the, and the restrooms, and then we took the old Pud Muddy parking lot and we turned it into what we now call, fondly called the garden courtyard. The second thing that we came up with is we needed to bring this garden into the 20th century. For one thing is we want, didn't want it to be just a stroll, we wanted it to be educational. And for me, I wanted to find those people like you that were interested in conservation, love nature, want to get involved, and as you can ask any volunteer that we have now, which as a nonprofit volunteer organization we have many, they all love something about this garden, but most likely more, no two of them love the same thing. They found what they really like to do, and then they do it, we allow them to do it. In 2003, we, uh, we got a grant to build the Butterfly Habitat and the Boardwalk. The Boardwalk was key and component too because we wanted everyone to have a chance to, to explore the botanical art and enjoy it. Uh, as I pointed out prior to that, it was hack your way through it, you know? Uh, we would meet on Saturdays and see what volunteers showed up and did the best we could with cleanup. The boardwalk, six foot wide, off the ground, so Mother Nature could go underneath. We didn't have to dig any trenches for our, our irrigation of our electric, because it was all underground. And it was all made from recycled materials from the dump. The tree recycles itself every day, so we have a theme here, right? No dirt, but it recycles itself all the way around. So why not recycle what comes out of done? And that's what you experiment. Well, not only within the boardwalks, but in four areas, you probably notice that you have the walkways made from that spongy material. Yeah. Guess what? Recycled materials out of the done. What it is really nice is that it keeps the aesthetic of, of nature natural uh, in our wildlife areas that we don't want concrete. It's specifically, uh, specifically Davian Pond in Western Loop. The Stock Island tree snail, this is one of its last remaining strongholds, is at this garden. It, they will not cross cement and all that stuff. It's like, it's like a desert to them. Uh, but for this other material, yeah, they don't have any problems getting back and forth. And it is during the wet season that they're most active. That's when they switch trees and they meet their partners and all that other fun stuff happens. I, uh, that was the big year, too, because that's when we went to the city of Key West and we found the help of the Florida Community Trust. Does anyone know who that is? awesome organization in the state of Florida, whose primary purpose is to buy back private land and open it to the public. They heard about our four year fight, really since 2000 to 2005, to get this land 
that the Navy had taken away from us back to the Botanical Garden. Well, we did it four years and $4.5 million later. But luckily, Florida Community Trust helped us, um, uh, uh, gave us a grant for a large portion of it. Well, we had to come up with the city of Key West $980,000 to make the transaction happen. Why was that important? Well, you see it when you park in our parking lot and you look at that pond. This was called Stock Island for a reason. Does anyone know what that reason is? We were the only place south of Florida City that there was fresh drinking water. People kept their livestock here. My analogy is that George said to Eunice, I'm going to stock out and get the mules because people kept their mules, their horses, their cows, their goats. Everything was here because it was the only place that had fresh water. The only other place was actually before Front Street was Front Free Street. There was one little section called Marshy Area that flooded now and then, uh, but not water. Uh, once we got the land back, we didn't even know about it until um, Hurricane Dennis came and then all those hurricanes, 2004 and 5, uh, we had uh, about a foot and a half foot of fresh water with 52 species of native water plants that were sitting down there just waiting. Because when the Navy came in, the buildings were all condemned because, you know, they made the cement out of salt water back then and it crumbles. So they just, they just condemned everything and plowed it off. I still remember seeing this whole area was just a white powder all over the place. And anyone that's been here as long as I have may recall that period when they first put it up for sale as a five-acre parking lot. Who in town knows about a five-acre parking lot in the West? You know that's not right. Something's wrong. Then they were going to do an assisted living with Bayshore Manor. And then they were going to put a fire department on five acres. So we all knew that just stunk to high heaven. There was a reason for it. And when the commission finally approved it, we found out why. Associated with this parcel of land is two and a half acres of a pristine mangrove across the street. When you leave here, just look. A couple developers in town, I won't mention any names, realized that, and you know, that's over $22 million of oceanfront property. You know what it could look like? Just look across the cow channel over there at the Hilton. It looked like that over there before they got a hold of it, and now they plowed all the mangroves down and they put the rock fortifications. That's just what we do. And what we do is say, that's not right, we're not happy. And uh, after we got the land back, we invested another $2 million. The South Florida Water Management District stepped in, and they helped us uh, rehabitat that pond. Uh, as we all well know, you can recreate something, but it'll never be as good as the, as the real one in nature. But we did pretty close, because when we started in 2000, we did our master plan with Raymond Jungle. Is anyone familiar with that name? He is renowned for his tropical landscape projects from South Florida all the way through the Caribbean. He is the man when you put it. So he stepped in and he helped us with the master plan. And when we got the pond back, he was there when we started reconstruction, the original pond. He was there on hand when in 2006, we had permitted and petitioned Key Largo to save 60 major, uh, uh, major specimen trees, old trees, out of a development project. But within three weeks of root pruning, the contractor decided he didn't want to wait, so he just cut them all down. Uh, we, uh, we had, uh, just the way we are, uh, we were lucky enough to know somebody at the time that had a flatbed. We went up there and we saved 11 of the trees, of which nine of them are still at the Stock Island Pond over here. You're going to see them on the northeast side when you come across the bridge. That's why it looks like such an old world habitat, because we were able to save those trees. Imagine if we could have put in 60 of them. It would have been pretty spectacular. Now, we have three different water features here. Actually, four now you can talk about, and I can give the fourth one a little bit later. 12 feet of fresh water here. The fun thing about that fresh water is, if you go to the University of Florida Great Lake Watch program, this pond is listed as a Great Lake. <laughs> now, I still laugh about it. I'm from Texas. I know what a lake looks like. We don't have a lake. We have about oh, maybe an acre, not quite two acres, but we have it tested every month from the University of Florida, 12 feet of fresh, sweet rain water. And because we have that fresh, sweet rain water, to the migrating birds and butterflies, like you and me driving down the interstate, we see truck stop. A place to stop, eat, drink, rest, and then go about your journey. And that's why we can boast that we have 213 species of birds coming through this garden every year. It is actually reported on a national website called eBird.org. 
You can go in there and look at the day, you can look at the month, you can look at the quarter, you can look at the season and they'll tell you what birds other good people like you have spotted and reported. And I think that's huge. I think that's huge in a statement for not, that we're not just about the green stuff. We're about the stuff the green stuff produces, right? Because the birds wouldn't be coming here. I mean, the big fig tree over there, what we call the, uh, um, uh, the birding trail, uh, in December, a bald eagle hangs out at the, on the 45, 50 foot fig tree because he knows lunch is coming. Once it fruits out, all the birds come in, the gumbo limbos, the pigeon plums, even the poison wood, all produce the, the berries and the fruits that the, the they species. And I'll get more of that, how you can help in that aspect as well. So that was huge on that aspect, getting that land back, starting the pond back. It was really, really cool because the contractors came in and they started digging the pond out in, in three sections. So there was a bridge in between, so the big, what do you call that? The excavator. Yeah, yeah, the big ones, the big ones, with the, with the tank train trails on them, uh, could get across to it. And I would go out there after, you know, while they were working and said, who turned the water on? Because the water didn't come up this way. The water all came that way. So there was pockets of water all over this land that was just waiting to be rediscovered and filled it up. It was the prettiest color of milky blue, you know, like our, um, like our water looks when you start sailing south, that, that kind of milky, uh, transparent sky blue color. It was breathtaking. Uh, back in that day, we had a turtle in our courtyard pond that we finally called. Uh, it was Herbie until we found out it was Herbina. Uh, uh, she did, it's supposed to be an escape-proof pond, and within a day of the tractors leaving and them opening the full pond, Herbina was gone. And um, she was rescued from Hurricane Wilma by the SPCA and then donated over to the Botanical Department. And um, I just finally called her my daughter because I fed her and took care of her. She was gone for a day. We couldn't find her. We actually took eight people over around here. We found her over in the new pond. She was out there like Esther Williams going, isn't this great? Isn't this great? <laughs> and of course, I'm just going, get over here, you bad girl. Like so and she comes swimming over me. She was so excited because she didn't realize, but I did. You know, that pond was like a brand new refrigerator. It was pretty, but there was nothing in it. So we put her back in the, in the courtyard pond, and lo and behold, two days later, she was back out there loving life. <laughs> so it took about a year and a half for the pond to actually cycle itself so that it is. So right now, um, it is actually where you're going to find your freshwater marsh birds. That mar I, could do. I, I saw the, um, 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 what is it? The moorhens were here. The gulinaries are called. They are really pretty because they have a red peak with orange and then they're black with purple. Uh, they make right through here. They're actually, uh, um, they're lily walkers from South America. They have three toes, snowy coat, but they swim like ducks. So you're gonna find the pied bill greets, your American coots, you know. All of those freshwater fowl come through here and migrate through. Now and then we get a, salt, a marsh bird come in, but they come here just to take a shower and rinse off and when they go out their journey. Davian Pond in the back, that's where your brackish water is. Uh, after Hurricane Wilma, we had um, Ken King out and a hydrologist to say that proved that it was part of the aquifer. This pond is not. It stays consistent at 12 feet all year long. Whereas Davian Pond goes up and down with the king tides because the ocean's underneath of it. But because of that, there's a dragonfly that comes out of Davian Pond that locals know about but not many other. It's related to the common red skimmer. But because of the association to the saltwater and the shrimps underneath, our dragonflies come out really hot pink, like, like disco hot pink. Uh, of course, there's a joke about Key West involved with that, but it has nothing to do with it. University of Michigan came out for two years and studied on it and realized, you know, that the, the grubs of the dragonfly are carnivorous, right? And they're underneath there and they go in the salt water long enough to eat a shrimp. And that's what they do, and much like flamingos, they come out with a color that's on it that's pretty, really cool. All right, and then of course in 2005, because of these changes, we were designated as the southernmost trail out of U.S. Highway 1, the scenic highway, and the big news about it was the Great Florida Burning Trail. I was very fortunate all the way through the 2000s, all the way up through 2006, to have associations with and networking with the um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, we were good friends with the, the Pier D Refuge, and we had a lot of the park rangers come down here and, and um, you know, I was one of the first employees at the visitor center in 2004 when the uh, local Audubon said there's no birds at the botanical garden. 
And within three weeks, people come through and there were not only 52 species of birds identified, uh, but 11 were in threat and endangered list, and two of them were never seen here in the Keys before. So that's how we started, I know of, and that's my history getting to where I can stand frank. So we have 213 different sightings of species here at the garden, because yes, we do have birds at the garden. All right, and then of course, 2006 and 2007 was the, uh, the um, capital project to restart the pond and all that other such. Restoration of the pond, inspiring wetlands. Big component was in 2008, was when the EPAC, Endangered Plant is Advisory Council, stepped in, heard about our conservation efforts, and gave us $64,000 to start and build our native nursery. Um, we were very happy about that, but the whole, comp the whole purpose of that was not just our collection, but those threatened and endangered species that we were just talking about earlier. Um, 2009, we opened the Cuban Palm Exhibit, with, uh, uh, what does that say, 16 species of rare and unique plants. Uh, right now, every one of our trees are listed as specimens, which means they're the biggest, the healthiest. Uh, we have been noted as the best collection of Cuba palms uh, in South Florida. Uh, but more importantly, every one of our species now are now on the threatened and endangered species, even on the global level, even in Cuba. They're, they're getting harder and harder to find. Um, the Cuban chug exhibit followed. And the Cuban chuck exhibit has started with four vessels. We didn't think anyone would be interested in now. I think they get more attention and more pictures taken than any tree we have in the garden. This is a huge, it's a great humanitarian story. Uh, in 2010, we opened the Blue Butterfly Garden, not to be confused with the historic. The historic, we call it historic because that was what was left of the original botanical garden. But we opened the Blue Butterfly Garden, which is on the far east side of the pond, because we wanted to put, you know, both, both butterfly gardens in the field of dreams. Build it, they will come. And that's what we we're thought about. We, we did the study, we did the research on native plants and, and formulated, you know, which is the host of the butterfly, which are the host of the caterpillar, so that there would always be a, a, a full circle of life going on and protected, you know. Uh, the whole idea was to put the plants out there and, um, from Texas, you know, Luby's, Luby's the cafeteria. You go in and there's everything to choose from, you have to decide how that were happening today. That's what we wanted to do, to so give everyone a chance. Out of the five species of blue, we attracted all but the Miami blue. But what I am is proud to say that later on, I'll bring into it, we did this association with the University of Florida Care Butterfly Association. Uh, they're due, they have a satellite research facility in Big Pine. And they have determined there is a small, limited colony in Big Pine, and then another one out in the Marquesas. Now, I've heard this tale since I moved here that there were blue butterflies out of Marquesas, but nobody had any proof to it. All the way back six years ago, they went out there and said it's a small population. They're not even living on their traditional liquor be nicker beans. They're living on the black bean and the two other species that guess what we have here. And so I got really involved with the director over there and what we're trying to do, and I'll get to that in more in a second, is put a butterfly conservation program together that hopefully we could do a satellite research facility here. And as I pointed out to him, you, know, you drive between there and Big Pine, you know, four times a week. If one or two escaped, it wouldn't be any big deal, right? <laughs> that we can actually get the Miami Blues reestablished out here at the Botanical Garden. It would be really, really, really cool. I loved it. And then, of course, uh, the, uh, the EPAC money put, was put into effect that in 2010, we opened our first uh, native nursery and focusing on the and education of the endangered plants of the Keys. We, focused, we started originally with 10 endangered species of plants. Uh, and through that, we have grown into close to 200 different species now, 90 of which are on that threat of endangered, endangered species. That 2011, we celebrated its 75th anniversary. And to celebrate that, we published our first garden guide. Um, we put that together because we wanted everyone to have a chance. You've been around the garden, you see the little numbers and such. It was a way for you to go to the book and you can see stop number 10. It's like fine wall though. You look at it and you say, okay, that's what's there. And then what we did is we, we gave three examples, a picture, a description, and, uh, and uh, the kind of fruit. And the final thing was all that together because it was for these butterflies or for those birds or for these pollinators. That kind of a deal so that everyone get it firm grasp on, it's not just there to be pretty, it has a function. 
and a function that we all should appreciate if we appreciate Mother Nature. We also, um, um, that, that was uh, 18 native species to put the Blue Butterfly Garden together. Uh, we had $100,000 that we got a grant to do, and within six weeks, the iguanas ate it all the way down to the roots. So the first time in my career, we had to grow plants in cages. <laughs> because the cages was plumbed with chicken wire, so the iguanas couldn't get into it, and gave everyone a chance to establish them once they're established. So if you're having that problem in your yard, your yard there, there is the answer right there, because the cage can grow as big as you want the plant to do, and then once they're established, they're usually pretty good. All right, um, on 2016, with our 80th anniversary, we celebrate that by our Cactus Baron exhibit. You'll find it on the North Side Tour. It is a premium example of what's not around anymore. Because back in 2010 and 16, on Lower Matacombe Key, with the EPAC program, we got a permit to go and pull plant seeds and actually specimens out of Lower Matacombe rock barren. Rock barren is not tropical, it is not uh, green, it is your white gravel limestone. A lot of people, the public, are really surprised that there are five different species of native cactus, tropical cactus, of which we have each specimen here at this Garden. But currently, uh, as we all well know, um, that whole area all the way through Big Pine Key is what, three inches further underwater than it was 15 years ago? Mm -hmm. And that salt inundation, the salt coming in, has pretty much eradicated the plants over there because they can tolerate it, but they can't live in it. And don't forget, when you see the water come up here, it really means underneath it goes all the way to there because it builds itself up. So we were very proud of that, and that's what we've got over here on the North Side Tour. Um, we celebrate our 80th anniversary by actually republishing the Garden Guide. I've got my Bible here. I allow people to touch it and look at it, but you can't have it <laughs> because we don't have any more, and uh, we're in the process of, of, uh, of redoing it because in 2017, not only did we open our fourth water feature, is our canoe kayak landing. Does anyone know that there is a, uh, a scenic paddle trail. That's really a, more of a boater's idea. There's one that goes on the Gulf side and one that goes from Key Largo all the way on the ocean side. We built the kayak landing so everyone could be either to launch or to, uh, uh, to land there and um, that really finished one of my dreams to have everyone, as I pointed out with ADA compliancy, everyone should get a chance to visit the garden. So right now, you know, you can walk in, you can pedal your bike in, you can drive in, you can paddle in, and I tell everyone, Funly, but we're close enough to the airport you can parachute in if you wanted to. No reason why you can't visit the garden because everyone can get to it. And we're very happy about that. But at the happiness and task because Irma hit us, 120 miles an hour, uh, we lost 90% of our canopy and we lost over 147 trees and all. We were able to, and Ed was here to help with that, we were able to uh, re-erect a small percentage of them. Uh, but I'm happy to report that over 90 of the trees were replaced by plants from the nursery. Mm -hmm. In the past, we would have had to be going up the keys because of our collection policy. We have to be really careful. They can't be from you know Maryland. They can't be grown in Georgia. They have to be within our region, and Providence has to be proved that they either came from the seeds or, in many cases, like our palm collection, were private collectors that had them in their yard. And so that saved us a ton of money. But, you know, God bless the, uh, the FEMA as well because um, 2018 and 20, uh, we had 1.25 yeah, $1 million dollars worth of damages. We lost roots, we lost buildings, we had all these other things as well as our trees. Um, FEMA stepped up in and uh, reimbursed us $589,000 of it. The rest of the money came from good people like you who donated. Plus, we went for every grant we could get our hands on to help us get through it. All right? That was good there. I'm not going too long, am I? This is about done here. Uh, we didn't rest on our laurels. COVID hit in 2020. We all know what fun that was. Did not. We uh, worked, the board of directors and myself worked at the City Key West for six months to get this garden reopened for you. Because our platform was there was no safer place to avoid the coronavirus than out in six foot wide boardwalks, out in the sunshine, bringing fresh air. Because all of us that were, you know, fearing the news, staying stationary where we're at, getting cooped up, needed a break, a place, safe place to be. 
So we were able to open up in the fall of 2020 when everyone else was, uh, was closed. We were open for about two and a half months before US Highway 1 was reopened. And then we were still free and open to everyone that came in all the way up through January of 2021. Once again, stipulation was we're here, it's outdoors, it's safe, it's a safe place to be. That we wanted to make sure the community knew and utilized us for that purpose. Big news at that time is we didn't stop with our collection because our net is a huge organization, it's internationally, um, and their whole purpose is like through the uh, Department of Agriculture, it's all about wooded plants. They recognized us for our collection, conservation efforts, but the fact that we have over 250 species, the actual number is 262 different species of wooded plants. Woody is what they call it. Woody is your hard bark, your mahoganies and stuff like that. Not your palm trees that sway, the ones that crack when the winds hit. Those are your hardwoods. They recognized for it, and of course, their whole purpose and the whole thing is you had to, I mean, we had 120 different things that we had to pass before we got accredited for it. Uh, God bless Mary Chandler, our Director of Conservation on the EPAC program for helping to do that. Uh, this was to provide um, um, uh, interactive, collaborative, international community arboretum and tree-focused professional facilities that sharing the knowledge, experience, and resources to help arboretum meet their institutional goals and to work to raise professional standards. We were doing that here, but we didn't know anyone was watching. And that's when I coined the phrase that we act, we think globally, but we act locally. Because you don't dream it and it isn't going to happen, but we can instill certain practices and studies that they, people can take with you and analyze. Not only was 2021 was our 85th anniversary, but huge was the accreditation with the Botanic Garden Conservation International, BGCI, organization out of United Kingdom, associated with the Kew Botanical Gardens in United Kingdom. Their whole organization, nonprofit organization, is to help botanical gardens achieve certain standards. And we went to them and it literally happened in three months when they saw what we were already doing. The whole purpose of them uh, was uh, uh, help non-botanic gardens recognize achievement in plant conservation and focuses on conservation actions that support local, national, and global, um, uh, global goals, conservation goals. So, we think globally, we act locally, and see where it takes us. And we're very proud of that accreditation because it's not that easy to get. Um, I call this one the big year. No, don't do that for me, please. I call this the big year. I know you can't really see it, I don't like the color on it. Not only did we talk, uh, create our zebra longwing butterfly conservation project, during Irma, the loss of habitat, uh, literally 15 different species of butterflies literally on the brink of extinction because they lost their habitat. Our education program documented the zebra longwing. We all know the zebra longwing is the state butterfly. We wanted to help them repopulate in the wild. And uh, it was going good until Ian hit, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, in May of 22, uh, we were started working with the, uh, the uh, Boy Scouts of America, their sea camp on the Big Munson Island Reforestation Project. For those of us who have friends and family that live up in the Middle Keys, we all know that they were decimated after Irma. In fact, Big Munson lost every one of all the trees, all the vegetation, everything. It was a barren island. So we, were, we started working with them May 22 to actually reforest the island the way, you know, in, the, in hopes that it'll come back and do what it's supposed to do. We're very proud of that. But what we already mentioned earlier in September of 22 was the big thing that you get the credit for was the passing of the referendum um, that allowed, uh, it passed 91 to nine um, the, to allow the garden a 99 year lease. And you can see the two proud papas there at the bottom. I was able to witness with Ed Cunningham the sign of the lease on November 21st, 2023. I think that's a major achievement in my mind. Thank you for all of you. And just to be quick about it, the mission and the purpose of the garden is to preserve, develop, and expand and maintain the historic Key West Tropical Forest Botanical Garden as an Arboretum Botanical Garden, Cultural Heritage Museum, Wildlife Refuge, and Education in that Center. We do that by showcasing the historical significance of flora and fauna, as I stated, South Florida, the Keys, Cuba, and the Caribbean, and emphasis, emphasizing the cultivation of threatened and endangered plants. We do that, and our vision is to encourage the study of the collection. That's the whole key component about it. And of course, promote the benefits of the natives. <coughs> Am I out of time, Ed? It is two. Oh, it is two. Can you all give me like 10 more minutes? Yes. 
Why did we go native? Well, for one reason, we were here 87 years. <laughs> I have to bring that up again because it's so big. I put in the definition of habitat, the natural home or environment of an animal, plant, or other organization. Natural. Not introduced, not changed, but natural. And of course, the known threats that we all know about uh, is there uh, climate change. We all agree it's, we, it's, it's real, it's happening to us, right? And the loss due to urbanization and pollution, fragmentation, and invasive species. We also went native because back in 2000 when we came up with a master plan, it separated us away from just about every other botanical garden except for, um, I guess except for, we're one of six gardens in the world that focuses on native plants. Um, we went native before ecotourism was a thing. And it's just really within the last six years that, six years that people started really getting interested and involved in learning more about their travels and so forth. Native plants suit the environment because of the diversity of uh, key specific plant materials. The seeds and cuttings fit our, our weather. Genetically evolved in our environment, climate, geology, and topography, most often salt tolerant, and they're native to a migratory uh, fauna protection. Not only for the food, but don't forget to protect them from that bald eagle that sits up in the tree. All right. Going native is cool. It costs less, needs less water once established. Uh, myself and two other full-time employees, we have five part-time people. That's it. The rest are the volunteers. If we had to pay everyone to come and do what you witness here, we, we, would, we would be able to do it. Our volunteers really fulfill uh, about 85% uh, of what needs to happen around here. Our collection is recognized uh, 532 species, over 8,000 in the garden. We're talking about 250 woody pants, uh, 213 divine species of birds, 39 butterflies, 11 species of damsel and dragonflies, four species of turtles, which includes Miss Verbena, and over 15, 1,500 species of pollinators and your bugs. I didn't include the raccoons, the possums, the snakes, and the gnolls and the lizards that we have. In fact, we tell our, our visitors here that said they, they love, they love the iguanas, they love them. And I tell them, if you catch it, you can take it home. Yeah, please. Yeah, love it please that much. Internationally, we are recognized as the frost free, uh, only frost free tropical forest and botanical garden in the continental United States. Uh, we're in one of the, um, uh, uh, we are one of 25 locations that are well known for its biodiversity. But we're a vision of getting crazy. There we go. And um, we're, uh, um, we have known in one of uh, we're in one of Florida's five areas of critical concerns, which means there are species for fauna that are here and nobody, nowhere else in the world. If this garden was gone, those species would be gone as well. How do we do it? Conservation education is key. Talking to you now. Thank you so much for listening to me. Hopefully, you take a little bit of that home with you because it's not what we're doing as this organization. It's why we're doing it and how we do it because today's time your macro micro habitats like your backyard your porches and so forth are as key and important as this big 15 acres is because lost are those stock ways that the birds and migrations used to come through the forest that they used to hang out in. Now they're hitting buildings and they have one or two trees that they hang in and then the people get mad because there's 2,000 birds sitting in one little tree because there's no other little tree. Having that not only opens you up to uh, the beauty, and of course doing, as I pointed out, the, uh, what you can do in your backyard, but you're helping all these other little species. And we've already covered the other two. I won't take time to do it again. Um, we went through all of that. Donations and, and grants key, EPAC, as I pointed out. Volunteers. Volunteers, we have an excellent volunteer program. I invite you to volunteer. We have everything as stationary as helping in the office or whatever, or uh, helping weeding in the nursery to actually getting physical, getting out there and working a garden like you would do in your own yard. Um, and the native plant nursery, I just went through all of that stuff before. We're very proud of it. As you well know, when you have a party at your house, you notice how everyone ends up in the kitchen? Right? That's our kitchen. Not only are they cooking with plants, but uh, it used to be the visitor center to the nursery open. Now it is our center of communication. It's where everyone meets, it's where everyone talks about what's going on from the community. I say my tribe, you guys are my tribe, but it's also the culture that we've created down here on environmentally conservation friendly people. Uh, and we go all the way from adults down to our companion program, works with 7th to 12th graders, not only to get their community service, 
but 352 students in our program got scholarships because they showed up at college with a resume that said they worked for a nonprofit for four to five years that was all about conservation and preservation, and two or three had social media because they helped us with their Facebook. Uh, those colleges were very impressed with that aspect to it and helped them as well. And not to mention, all of them gets an opportunity to learn more than hospitality or marine biology. Before we started the program, our local community didn't even realize there was a future for our children in environmental studies, research, and conservation. Uh, one of our students actually went as far as uh, they are curator and the animal specialist at a zoo up north. They didn't even know about it until they came here and realized, oh wow. I mean, myself, you know, with Herbina, the others we have, you know, we have livestock now that's in our inventory list that was, that was all new on that aspect as well. There we go. The EPAC program was the big component of it. Let me go back to that. This is a picture of the, uh, of the cactus barren, but it lists those specific cactuses that we worked out. Uh, you can go out to our website, we do a husbandry report every year, report to the city, the county, and to our grantors on our inventory, what we're doing to it, and the changes that we've made, and, and the uh, successes that we made. All right. For those of you who want to learn more about Native, here's a picture that you need. Institute of Regional Conservation is just really our neighbors. We are listed under the Natives for Your Neighborhood, where people can go online for where I find the plants that fit our area. Ta -da! We're right here, but you can go there as well. And besides, you know, look at the scenery. This is just a pleasant afternoon for you to come out. You want me to go back to that picture? I saw you bring your hands. Okay. All right, there you go. I just, sat for, I just did this for fun because um, I was given a presentation on names at the garden, that's what this is about. But I didn't want to just give them a plant and a name and have to learn the Latin. <laughs> well, I don't know the Latin, I have people for that. But to show you, wax palms in the, uh, in the, in the uh, Cuban. The uh, white cababulias are the native, the yellows are not native. The uh, purple ones is of course our lignum vitae, which is our signature plant. The white heron, um, the um, uh, radiata, thrinax, do grow up to be about 40 foot tall. That's the picture of ours. Uh, there's a picture of your um, golden saddleback dragonfly, a picture of the historic Dapian pond in the back. Uh, that is a picture of our resident monarch. We've, we've learned and studied here. Everyone thought monarchs just migrated. From here, five generations north and then one generation south. But we helped establish the fact that there is a resident. They're only about this big, but they're here all year long. That picture on the bottom left is our, is our north side pond on a clear day. It's the reflection on the water of the clouds. That's why it looks upside down. And the iconic Western Loop, which still remains one of my favorite locations in the garden. And I didn't do this, but I had to take a picture of it because those volunteers and our staff and our board who love this garden all came up with this, but I wanted to point it out to you. It's not my words. It was that passion and love that says, this isn't a garden. It's a botanical masterpiece, and we would really love for you to be part of it. All right, and there's my information. And um, any questions, anything I can help with? Uh, if you enjoy this type of presentations, we do one once a month, the same day as we do our native plant sale. You can start a plant sale and then come here at one. Thanks.